Good morning, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to our Rotary meeting for Monday, March the 28th. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today. Brianne Curry from, is from Autism Ontario and is a fund development and volunteer coordinator for the Ontario Autism Ontario Western Region. As a parent of an 18 year old on the autism spectrum, she has been personally connected with Autism Ontario for over a decade and now has the privilege of working with the organization to develop new programs and initiatives to support children, adults and families with autism throughout our region. Autism Ontario is the province leading source of information and referral on autism and is one of the largest collective voices representing the autism community. Locally, they provide a variety of programs, supports, and services for our community, and their mission is to create a supportive and inclusive Ontario for autism. I would now like to pass control over to yourself, Brianne, for your presentation. Thank you very much, Don, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, I do have a presentation to share with you today. And uh, I will also have some time for questions and, uh, and comments at the end. And I always find there's always lots of interesting um, uh, questions from, from the audience. So I thank you very much for having me um, and I'll get started. Okay, so for before we begin, um, there may be some folks on the call here today who are a little less familiar with autism. And so I wanted to begin just with a brief discussion of what autism is. Um, and tell you a little bit about it from the sort of medical or um, diagnostic perspective. So it is classified as a lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder that primarily affects um, communication, social interactions and relationships, sensory processing, body language, executive fun functioning, and it occurs across all the spectrum of humanity. Now, there's often a lot of um, commentary that, you know, we're seeing an increase in rates or, uh, you know, people say, you know, are we diagnosing everything as autism? And, and that's not true. There, there is very specific diagnostic criteria, but primarily what you're seeing is, is um, effects in communication, social interactions, relationships, and sensory processing. So, some people with autism are able to live quite independently with some supports in their life, such as assistance with going out for groceries or counseling or um, employment support services. Whereas other people with autism require additional or extra supports and may not be able to live independently. Um, some people on the spectrum can participate in the workforce or in school uh, quite independently while some require ongoing care. Some people with autism are non-speaking and they use technological devices to communicate. Um, and others are, are quite uh, communicative and, and um, you know, uh, great uh, advocates for themselves and, and for their peers. Each one of the people that I've described right now um, are autistic. One is not more autistic than the other. They are all autistic and they are all deserving of the ability to participate in community life, just like we all do. Um, on our website, autismontario.com, I'll link that later. Um, we do have a number of resources available. If you're interested in learning more about autism, we also have a variety of videos um, that share different perspectives and, um, we try to uh, always use the voice of people with autism. And so we have uh, people describing their own experiences in their voices um, on our website. So if you're interested in learning a little more, please uh, visit autismontario.com. Um, I also wanna take a moment just to discuss how we talk about autism, especially for those who are unsure of what language is considered appropriate. And as we all know, language is always changing. Um, and, and sometimes people are uncertain of what is the right term. And so while the medical community still classifies autism as a disorder, the reality is that most autistic people prefer the term neurological difference or neurological condition, which kind of takes away that negative association with the word disorder. So just being autistic means that your brain processes information differently. Um, and as I said, at Autism Ontario, we try to follow the lead of people with lived experiences with autism. And because the autistic community at large most often uses identity first language, so autistic person, um, 
that's that's we often follow that. Um, however, there's a lot of advocates out there who say that we should use person first language, so person with autism. Um, the reality is that that if in doubt, you can say on the autism spectrum, and that's usually a safe bet. But our experience from the autism community is that identity first language is is really important and powerful. So people always want to know a little bit about the numbers. Um, so currently, um, as of you know, um, 2017, I think the stat was was most recently updated. Our numbers were one in 66 Canadian children and youth being diagnosed. And the estimate is that about one to 2% of the Canadian population on the spectrum is autistic. And so that translates to about 135,000 people across Ontario. So it's a significant number. And again, it's across all ages of the lifespan. Uh, it certainly doesn't end when someone hits adulthood. So just really briefly about Autism Ontario, um, we are a, a registered charity with a uh, history of almost 50 years of advocating for and providing information and resources and referrals uh, for uh, supporting people with autism across the province. And of course, over that time, our specific mission has um, shifted, not shifted, but, but transitioned slightly um, through time as the needs have changed. Um, and currently our uh, mission and vision statement are listed here. Typically, we, uh, we love to collaborate with other community organizations. We know that there are many, many services out there that are supporting people with disabilities. And so we don't wish to recreate the wheel per se, but we love to collaborate with other groups um, to um, offer services and, and supports. So across the province, we offer a wide variety of programs and services. Um, so some of our services at the provincial level are offered um, in French, um, we have lots of virtual programs and opportunities. Advocacy typically is conducted at our provincial level as well. Um, and then we, we have a variety of programs and services and engagement opportunities as well as learning opportunities for families. But we also um, have regional teams. Um, so there are seven regions across the province. And here in the West, our region is quite vast, uh, including uh, Huron, uh, Bruce, Gray, Perth, Oxford, Middlesex, Lambton, Essex, Chatham, Kent, and Elgin counties. So in this region, we have had uh, well-established volunteer-led chapters for many, many years. Here in London, um, we've had a, uh, a chapter since the 70s. Um, and in other areas, Windsor, Huron, Perth, and Chatham, they have had active chapters as well. But many other areas across this region have not had active chapters. And as a result, we have lots of underserved um, communities across this region where families that are struggling to access therapeutic services, community respite and support, and social recreational opportunities are, are really in need. We also know that there's many communities with unique needs that are related to autism, um, even within areas where we've been traditionally active. So for example, new Canadians who may struggle with accessing supports and receiving diagnosis or even navigating the system, um, they require um, additional supports as well beyond what we were able to do in the past with our volunteer run chapters. Um, in addition to people who are uh, living in rural, remote locations, living in poverty, and those who are experiencing other forms of barriers or discrimination. So there's lots of work for us to do to really uh, broaden the services across this region and uh, ensure that we are reaching people and providing support where they're at. Locally, our regional team, so we, we now have a staff uh, regional team, and we work in communities to try to support our families across the lifespan. So we identify gaps in what people receive from uh, the province or, or from you know, provincially funded supports. And we try to close those gaps through non-therapeutic programming. So for example, our team won't offer like a, a speech therapy program, but we will offer caregiver support programs or uh, social skills programs for youth and so on. So we offer things like one-to-one um, -one support for programs um, for skill building, fitness, recreation, 
um, programs specifically for adults. So um, allowing adults on the spectrum to connect with other peers who, who they can build um, networks with and, and develop support. Um, we, lately, we've had a large focus on building our adult programs as well as um, supporting mental health of individuals on the spectrum and their family caregivers. Uh, we know that there's been a real need uh, for that, and, um, and so that, that's a major focus as we move forward. Um, finally, we, we also really are leaning into parent and caregiver and grandparent support um, and engagement opportunities. So it's been really great to be able to allow grandparents and parents to connect with one another, to, um, to ask questions and share experiences and learn a little bit more about how to support their loved one with autism. And finally, we also have representatives in our school boards at our special education advisory committee so that we have a voice at the table um, in provincial education. So I wanted to just highlight a couple of the impacts of the pandemic that we are feeling in our community. So these are some of the challenges that my colleagues and I are hearing from others. Um, and lots of disability advocates have expressed that the experience of people throughout the pandemic has varied greatly. You know, everyone on this call has had a different experience, of course. And, you know, families with autism are, are no different in that way. But um, some, of, some of the challenges that families with autism were experiencing before the pandemic were exacerbated throughout. So, for example, um, lots of services were either closed or, or um, moved to virtual settings, which were, you know, varying degrees of success for some of those, for some of those therapies. And so uh, due to a lack or a loss of services, uh, many families reported that their, their children have regressed and have lost skills that were developed. Uh, and wait lists continue to be a problem, uh, particularly for those limited in-person services that people really need. Um, in terms of education, with school closures, uh, families with children and teens with autism have had to juggle special education needs that were not uh, really easily or adequately met in virtual learning environments. Um, so, you know, supporting other children in the home, perhaps working yourself, um, and then um, trying to support your young person with special education needs uh, resulted in many families actually having to pay for private care in the home during the day. Um, while, the, while there were school disruptions. Uh, isolation. So pre-pandemic, many families experienced some degree of isolation due to the challenges just in participating in society. And data shows that families of children with autism participate in lower rates in community. So they're not going out to the same places at the same frequency that other, other families are doing. Um, and through the, challenge, through the pandemic, of course, this was exacerbated for many individuals. So that, that level of isolation really um, skyrocketed. Mental health and stress, we're seeing a, a rapid or, or serious increase in mental health challenges and reports of very high stress among autistic individuals and their caregivers, which again, were already high to begin with. Um, health risks, there, there are uh, quite a, a lot of people with autism also have other um, diagnoses or health issues. And so there are some um, individuals with developmental disabilities that are at a higher risk of contracting COVID. Um, and so that has, that has been a major concern for people as well. Financial challenges, I'm sure that many of you uh, are already aware of many of the financial challenges that most people in our community may have, may have gone through during the pandemic. But um, from a charitable organization perspective, of course, um, all charities, you know, uh, were facing changes in their, in their fundraising and finance through, uh, through the pandemic. And so some of the services that we may have offered um, do, you know, were, were um, paused due to those uh, funding changes. And finally, um, aging out of services. So for example, if your child was 16 in March, 2020, they have now aged out of child services at the age of 18 and uh, have lost these last two years of potential support um, due to some of the pauses of services in the community. 
So I uh, wanted to mention briefly just about diagnosis. So surveys do indicate that it can take multiple years um, for, for families to receive a diagnosis. And, and families have told us that while they're waiting for diagnosis, uh, reaching out to Autism Ontario was one of the most valuable resources that they had. You know, we're able to help people even before they have a diagnosis. We can uh, support parents. We uh, can invite their children to participate in social programs. Um, we can connect them with resources that we have and, and try to help them navigate those early days of, of the system, uh, even before diagnosis. Um, and then again, there's, there's just long, long waits for, for, wait, for services. <clears throat> so how are we going to move forward in the best way to support people? So our newly uh, formed regional staff team is working really hard to develop programs and services. And we're seeking partnerships, trying to expand our reach into new communities. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, we know we have a lot of ground to cover geographically, but also, um, you know, even within the communities where we're active, we, we want to be reaching new people and make sure that our communities are aware that we're here and that we're able to support people. So um, I'm just going to go through a few uh, potential ideas of ways that groups or individuals can help. Um, if you are so driven to do so. So um, as we emerge out of the pandemic, we're kind of gradually resuming in-person uh, workshops and opportunities. And so with that comes lots of opportunity for community involvement and awareness. Um, so of course, fundraisers are always welcome. And, and I always would start with that. So if any group is doing a, a car wash or anything like that, we're certainly very happy to come out and help and, and volunteer with you. Um, some groups really like to sponsor a, spe a specific program. So for example, we have a uh, program coming up this fall for teens to uh, practice cooking and uh, food preparation skills, life skills. Um, and so that's a really uh, fun program that uh, you know sponsorships are always welcome for. And then if you have a physical location, um, in-kind contributions like venue space are really, really great because then that allows us to host a, an event or a party or a workshop for parents and things like that. Uh, this is my daughter here at a past uh, Autism Ontario tubing event at Bowler, which was a lot of fun. We had uh, volunteers come out uh, from Western University and um, we love to have volunteers come out and spend time with our young people. Um, to uh, be a friendly face and, and enjoy a fun activity with them. And so that's always uh, something to look forward to uh, more in the fall when, when we're so hopefully out of the pandemic. Um, if you uh, work for an organization where there are employer matches, uh, we definitely uh, would love to support you with that. And you can reach out to us uh, to let us know. And finally, legacy giving is certainly um, always very, very welcome. And we have numerous ways of honoring legacy gifts. So uh, coming up, many of you know that World Autism Day is coming up on April 2nd. But if you don't know, it is a day where we celebrate uh, people on the spectrum while bringing to light systemic barriers that must be removed to create a uh, more supportive and inclusive Ontario. And so what I want to do is just show you we have a website here called Celebrate the Spectrum. And on this website, you can see there's different resources. There's ways for communities and schools to, be, uh, to become involved. Um, there's toolkits for teachers. There's uh, information for, for municipalities and so on. So there's lots of things here. You can learn a little more about autism and, uh, and how to get involved. And there's a link to donate there as well. And if anything um, that we would ask as you approach um, April 2nd or the month of April, which is uh, Autism Awareness Month, um, that you're just you know, listening to uh, the voices of people with autism out there in the community and resharing uh, and honoring their voices, putting those perspectives forward and uh, doing what you can to, to make your community a little more inclusive and understanding. And so this is a great place to start to learn how to do that. Um, I've also just uh, ha pulled up our website as well, Autism Ontario, if anyone is interested, or if you know someone in your life who is entering the autism journey, you can share with them our website and they can get in touch with us there and learn about the various programs and services that we offer.
So I just wanted to um, leave you with my email and uh, contact information. And um, I think that it is also on our website as well. So if anyone wishes to get in touch with me, feel free to do so. I will stop sharing. And happy to open it up to questions, comments, or uh, any other um, fun facts you want to share. Sir, what is the uh, correlation between autism and Asperger's? Oh, great question. So Asperger's um, is no longer diagnosed. It When they changed the diagnostic uh, manual in uh, the 2010s, I forget the exact year, um, it falls under the umbrella of autism spectrum disorder. So uh, in the past, we would have used terms like high functioning and low functioning, and we tend not to use those anymore because of the negative connotations. But Asperger's was kind of at that end where people would say it was more high functioning. Um, I think that there are a lot of people out there who, you know, may in the past have been diagnosed with Asperger's and now receive an autism diagnosis. Um, and, and so the benefit of having an autism diagnosis for a family is that you now have access to supports and resources, whereas with an Asperger's diagnosis, you did not. Malcolm, you were next with your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Don. Um, Brianne, I have a question about the degrees of autism because uh, I have a friend whose son is now 52 and he knows that it's me. Um, and yet you'll see a television show called The Good Doctor where this young man is a surgeon, I believe, in, in a television show. But what what are are there that the degrees of autism that is that part of when when they're diagnosed you know it's going to be severe does it get severe um are what what might be the levels that exist within that spectrum good that's a great question um and i'll, I'll preface my response by saying i'm definitely definitely not our expert um but but certainly you have those you know genius level savants who kind of fall under that very very higher functioning end uh level one um, and then you go down to individuals that really struggle with uh, cognitive ability, uh, nonverbal. Um, one of the biggest challenges, I think, for lots of people on the spectrum, regardless of where they fall on the level, is their executive functioning. So by that, I mean the ability to know that, you know, I have to get up at seven o'clock in order to be at school for nine and I have to do these four things and then I have to come home and I have to pay my bill or something like that. Those kind of processes are really challenging regardless of the level of, of autism. And so uh, I think that um, what I can say about the, the levels or, or the, the gradient is that girl, females and males tend to present differently. Um, a lot of girls and women kind of fall through the cracks because they present differently. And so it takes longer for them to receive diagnosis. Um, one of the bigger challenges for people with very severe autism, so people that require a lot of support, is that um, those families under, are under extreme pressure through their whole life uh, to sort out care. Uh, you know, services really drop off after the age of 18. And so you're navigating adult services. Um, you know, housing is, is always a challenge. And so um, I would, yeah, I, I think I probably didn't answer your question really well. Um, but but I would say that that there is a full spectrum of ability. And the challenges that come along with those different levels are, are unique. I would say it's probably pretty rare to have too many surgeons on the spectrum, but it's, <laughs> yeah. it's not impossible, of course. Right. Okay, thank <laughs> um, you. But they all have special interests, I would say. It's very oh. common to have really like tight interests in, in certain subjects on the spectrum. Right. Thank you very much, okay. Yeah. Rick, you're next. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Brianne. Uh, I've got two questions. My first one is is somewhat personal in that uh, I wonder if you could relay what your daughter's experience was with our education system. So she's gone through a lot of it by now. Yeah, that's my first question. My second question is um, in workshop and skills orientation for people with uh, various degrees of uh, the autism in, in the autism spectrum. 
What type of training or skills uh, assistance do they get in terms of when, for when they are involved in social interaction out in public? Okay. I'm going to answer that one first, just so I don't okay. forget. Um, okay. So the types of skills, so social skills training, um, it can look like a few different things. Um, it can be very life skills based. So uh, a care a care person or, or a workshop might take people out into the community to go for groceries and to interact with the shopkeepers. Um, and to know how to get on a bus and to, you know, ask the bus driver for help if you need and those kind of things. So they could be really hands on specific to like going through life. Um, there's also social skills training um, about, you know, making friends, um, developing safe friendships, especially for our teens, you know, how do I know if a group is safe to walk up to and be friends with and if they invite me to come out and join them at a at a thing, is it safe? And, you know, and how do I build a friendship? And so they'll walk them through, you know, we've gone through 12 week sessions where each week they take a little piece of, you know, becoming friends with people. Um, really modeling social behavior, like what is what is appropriate. And sometimes it seems a bit pedantic or, or overly simplistic, but but it works. It, it helps them to picture what appropriate is. Um, so they're not guessing. Um, and then you asked about our family or my daughter's experience in the school system. Um, thank you for asking that. It's not been easy. She uh, started school uh, coming out of nursery school with some red flags. She was four years old at the time. She didn't get diagnosed till she was seven. So we spent the first few years of her school uh, experience um, fighting for support and resources. She was very destructive. She was very um, impulsive. Uh, behavior was extremely challenging. And she got sent home a lot, almost every day at one point. I was getting phone calls from the school to pick her up early. And so when she was in grade one, I pulled her out of school. We homeschooled for a while. Uh, until she had her diagnosis. And then we hoped that when we brought her back to school that with the diagnosis, we would receive better EA support. Um, in the public setting, in a regular classroom setting, that actually didn't end up happening. Uh, she had a part-time support person, but the teacher still couldn't handle everything. And I, I no, no discredit to the teacher. She did the very best she could, but she had, you know, 28 kids in there. Um, and so my daughter actually in grade three was moved into an autism support program across the city. Uh, it was a small class of six kids with one teacher and two EAs. So a two to one ratio. And she remained in that program until grade eight when she went into high school. And uh, she now is in the autism program in high school, which is a great supportive model. Um, it has Again, one teacher, two EAs, and they float and they support the 12 kids that are in that program. But in the city of London, there are three such high school uh, ASD programs, so 12 spots each. So that is space for 36 teens with autism between grade nine and the age of 21, because they can stay in school till they're 21. So if we think about that, that is sorely, sorely inadequate. Um, it takes a lot of money and a lot of resources to run those programs. And, and I'm thankful that we have what we do have, but I was very, very lucky to get that spot for my daughter. And uh, it's certainly not easy. Um, so that's our example. Some families struggle more, some struggle less. Um, it's a fight for all of us. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Kirk. Yes, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation, Brian. Um, one question for you. Are you uh, considered a, uh, a supplemental uh, agency compared to what Thames Valley Children's Center is doing? Do we complement each other? Or what's your Autism Ontario status uh, in this region? Thank you. Yes. Um, so Thames Valley Children's Center delivers a lot of the provincially funded therapeutic supports. So they're a direct provider of things like speech therapy, um, applied behavior analysis and so on. At the local community level, we are providing non-therapeutic programs. So we are doing those things that are not funded by the ministry. So Autism Ontario does do ministry services, but not here locally, if that makes sense. Yes, okay. thank you. Thanks, Kirk. Jim Swan. Oh, you're muted, Jim. 
story for Ian and the rest. I just wonder if you're familiar with the series that's available, I think on Amazon now called As We See It. Um, and oh. it, uh, it is a- Yay, finally, I have time to ask my question. Do we, do we know what causes, do, do we know what causes autism or what the contributing causes are? We do not yet have a definitive answer. Um, off the record, I have spoken with researchers who feel that we're getting close to understanding. Um, some researchers really believe that it is some sort of gut mind connection or gut brain connection, uh, but there, there is no definitive cause yet. And I think that, uh, I, yeah, we're getting closer, but. Okay. Oh, Ian, you raised your hand again. I did. Uh... Just a quick one. Hopefully it doesn't take too long uh, to answer this, but we are friends with a family with two children. The older one is uh, struggling greatly in school. Um, and part of the struggle she's having is, is that her younger brother is nonverbal uh, autistic and the family devotes so much time and energy to this young boy who's now about 10 that she feels kind of abandoned at times in the family and it's done terrible things to her own self-esteem and ability to function in social settings and at school. Is there any counseling that is offered to families that are going through some of this kind of experience? Um, so direct counseling, no, but we have a couple of things that we offer. So one is called a SIB shop. It's a sibling workshop where we work with siblings of people on the spectrum to help them go through some of the challenging situations that are unique to being a sibling. Um, and, uh, and it also helps them build peer connections and work on their own uh, mental health as well. Um, and then uh, just parent and, and caregiver support that we, that we offer. Um, but to me, it sounds like this, this particular family might benefit from actual professional counseling. Um, if you wish, um, we can connect offline and I can, I can send you to a listing of resources of, of people that are really skilled in dealing with uh, individuals and families on the spectrum. Well, thank you, Brianne. It was a very interesting presentation, as you kind of guessed from all the questions that we had. Uh, the club was very much interested in it. In recognition of your presentation to our club today, a contribution has been made to the Polio Plus campaign of the Rotary Foundation to immunize 50 infants against polio. So because of you, Rotary is now one step closer to a polio-free world. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time and attention and all your great questions. Um, and thank you. I won't take any more of your time. I know we're, we're a little over time, but uh, do uh, check out CelebrateTheSpectrum.com um, coming up to next weekend, and that would be uh, most appreciated. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So we will proceed with club business. Um, the first one, just a quick reminder, if you are wanting to make donations um, for the Ukraine, the Rotary Foundation does have a special disaster response fund set up um, and it is eligible for a tax receipt. Similarly, Shelterbox Canada, who is a Rotary partner, um, has a special campaign set up, and the London Ukrainian Center is um, also collecting contributions for the Ukraine. Um, we also had a great speaker at the Satellite Club meeting last week. Uh, very interesting listening to Tatiana talk about the situation in the Ukraine and how things are working um, and kind of some of the background of what is happening there. So quite interesting. Um, one quick announcement on behalf of Randy, we are still looking for one final host family, Fernanda, our exchange student. She's coming from Switzerland next year. Um, if you have not had the opportunity to host an exchange student before, it is a wonderful experience. It's lots of fun. You will learn a lot by hosting a uh, young person from another country. You'll learn about their country. You'll learn about Canada and uh, lots of other fun things. Are there any, oh, one more announcement. Um, the Rotary Party is coming up in May. Tickets should be available in the next day or so. Um, the I'll, I'll pass it over to Jim. He's a better sales promoter of, of this party than I am. <laughs> there are a number. Uh, there are a number of people that 
we'll uh, eagerly uh, talk about it. And as soon as the uh, website is up and ready, we'll be sending people to get uh, tickets. And on your screen, you see the poster that uh, tells of all of the things that are going to be part of it. But uh, the entertainment is, is outstanding uh, with the, the wood chippers and Claire Lynch, who is, uh, who is a uh, Emmy Award winning, Grammy Award winning uh, and nominated uh, bluegrass artist. It's going to be great fun. Uh, and we've got a lot of other little things that will happen through the uh, evening that will have you uh, wanting to go uh, out onto a dude ranch for sure. Anyway, come to the Rotary Ranch party on May the 6th and be ready to uh, find us some sponsors, if you like, and uh, also auction items. So all of that, Diane will probably talk a little bit more about that. So Diane, you're next. You had your hand raised. Oh, thank you. And thanks, Jim. Um, that's exactly what I wanted to mention is um, for the Rotary Ranch party, any auction items that our club brings in goes right back to our club's local service projects. So the more we get, the more we make. So that's kind of all on us. So if you have anything, please email me um, the value. Um, the, actually, I'll send you a form. So just tell me you have something and I'll send you a form to complete. And we need a picture and uh, let's get those action items in so we can make some money. And Rick Coates. I'm going to comment as well on the Rotary Ranch party. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, delighted to mention that our club so far is doing very well in sponsorships. We have a big circle rider sponsor. We have a cowboy sponsor and we have a buckaroo sponsor. Um, the other thing that I'd like to uh, bring to all attention is that some Rotarians may consider Lynn and I are giving are going to be doing a Wrangler sponsorship and we're going to split it between the uh, passport club her passport club and and our club um, since a lot of us have not had the uh, had to incur the expense of attending meetings throughout the last two years maybe you can find it in your hearts and wallets to uh, Look at that Wrangler sponsorship, which is uh, $1,250. You get a $750 uh, tax receipt. Uh, you get four passes to the event. And um, the uh, roughly the club and any sponsorship gets anywhere from two thirds to 75% of that sponsorship going back into our own club activities and projects and that. So. Just, I'm just throwing that out. I don't want to. I don't want to put any pressure on anybody, but I'm just throwing that out that you may want to take a look at that. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Rick. Um, Diane, did you also have a looking for volunteers announcement? Um, sure. I'm. I'm not. Um, well, I'm. I'm not the coordinator for the whole volunteer for the whole thing, but I am looking for people to help me with um, the silent auction. Um, I'm, I'm looking for um, actually high school students. Like I've already got one um, friend's um, daughter who's gonna come out and help me. And I know, um, I think Julie and uh, Nikki are gonna help too in the evening with me and stuff. But um, yeah, if anybody wants to volunteer, um, we, need, we need lots of volunteers. So um, there will be somebody in charge of volunteers at some point. Um, but you know, if you know of anybody or if you're able, please let us know. Uh, and I wasn't actually referring to the uh, Rotary Ranch Party. I was referring to the food bank. Are oh, we I'm still sorry. <laughs> Good Lord. Okay, well, we need a pitch for the volunteers for the Rotary Ranch Party, too. So why not do it all at one shot, right? <laughs> um, okay, so we do have more room for people for Wednesday, April 27th at the food bank. We can have up to 12. We got about seven. So thanks for everybody who's jumped right on that. And if you're interested um, in helping out that night, 6 to 830, please let me know. I, I, I can comment on the uh, the coordinators for the volunteers for the Rotary Ranch Party are uh, Kyle Case, uh, our own satellite club member, and uh, and I'm not sure, I think he's going to be chair, and uh, Ryan Cochran, who is a uh, uh, former Rotaract student, I believe. I'm not exactly sure he's a Rotarian, but anyways, uh, so there are volunteer coordinators set up for that. Anybody wants to volunteer, just send me an email. Wonderful. Any other announcements for the club? Uh, 
I'll make a bingo announcement. We are going to have a bingo in the month of April. It's going to be in the last week of, of April, and I will be sending out a request uh, closer to the event uh, in the last week before the event, looking for volunteers for that first bingo in a pandemic long time. So uh, we're back on hopefully generating anywhere from $800 to $1,000 per bingo for the club. So a quick reminder of some upcoming activities for the club. Um, next week's meeting, we will have Bob Barney, Professor Emeritus from UWO, talking to us about the Olympics. The Satellite Club, they are waiting for a updated weather forecast to determine what they're doing on April 6th. Um, if the weather is nice, they will be doing a park cleanup at one of the two parks that they sponsor. We do have a board meeting for the club on Wednesday, April 20th. So it's still a few weeks away. And we, of course, have the President's Cocktail Hour tomorrow at 5 p.m. and the Coffee Clatch on Thursday at 10.30 a.m. That is everything for our meeting this week. Um, the last thing I want to remind everyone is that, yes, we in Rotary serve to change lives, and hopefully everybody will have an opportunity to do that sometime over the next week until we meet again.